Okay, it's starting now. All right. Thanks, thanks, April, for the reminder. All right, I turn the time over to you, uh, Todd. Okay, I'm just real quickly searching for the agenda. Here it is. Okay. Well, I guess the first thing I want to just do is say, hey, thank you for coming. Um, uh, uh, we've already gone through everybody who's here. Uh, I, I don't see any visitors. Um, but, uh, um, the first thing on the agenda is the approval of the uh, January 12th minutes. Um, is there any discussion on that? I move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, let's, let's quick vote then. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's uh, unanimous. Um, in that case, uh, we'll turn the time over to uh, Neil and Reed to uh, give us a general master plan update. All right, thank you. I'm going to share my screen after I move some of this out of the way. And great. We're gonna, we're gonna walk through the master plan update for the water and sewer quickly, we're going to review a couple of items. And what I want to actually do is remind us what a master plan is. And it's a guiding document that uh, helps us know what future projects need to be completed, what things we need to be looking for, and also how to fund those projects. When we embarked on this update, uh, we were envisioning uh, switching from a pay-as-you-go cash plan to the potential to bond or borrow for uh, the projects. The benefits of that included out the, the outpacing of construction uh, cost increases, so we could, we could get ahead of that, and also the opportunity to borrow at very low rates was there. So I've got open and, uh, the, the actual PDF of the entire uh, master plan. And if we skip all the way through to the end, it creates this bar graph that, that may look familiar from the previous format. But you'll see here uh, a couple of lines. One is this bottom blue line, that's where we were in 2016 with our revenues. Uh, then uh, in 2016, we revised uh, and went to a pay-as-you-go plan, uh, which showed which, which this solid line represents. Uh, that was a, a rate increase that got us about seven years worth of rate increases and then followed the uh, inflationary rate. Well, in 2020, we pushed pause on that while we studied the, the, the opportunities to bond. And that resulted in the, the, the revised plan for uh, our rate plan. If you look in FY22 here, which is where we are, uh, we are recommending in the master plan and the city council has agreed to bond for the projects that were once going to be paid for with cash moving forward uh, in order to save the city and save the residents money. And what that did is it created an opportunity to actually lower our water rates. Uh, that's what is going to be represented here uh, with this red line is you'll see that from 20, 
2020 to 2021, the line was intended to move upward. Uh, it moved laterally and then to FY22, you're gonna see it actually is coming down. And uh, people and residents will, will actually see that on their bill. So how did we come to that conclusion that, that these were the projects that were necessary? And how did we come to the conclusion that uh, those rates would support that? Well, that's what the, the, the document goes through. And as we scroll all the way back up and get start, we ask ourselves, where are we today? And then where are we headed? And this map uh, shows us where the future growth is going to happen and, and what we need to plan for. You can see the what uh, area has how many residents and how many employees. Uh, and, and that in turn gives us a demand on the water system. So we turn and, and head all the way down here and we look at this graph and this shows us the blue line where we were headed uh, with our demand for water. Uh, our goal moving forward is to conserve water uh, and follow the state guidelines of conservation. And that red line shows us where we will be if we do that. The blue dots show us where we've been and that's scattered all over, particularly uh, in, in some higher and lower years due to weather. Weather patterns dictate a lot of uh, the city's demand because we have a large demand for outdoor irrigation needs. Moving forward, uh, as we look at the stacked graph for where that water supply is gonna come from. Uh, we have springs, we have Provo River, we have storage in the various reservoirs above us. Uh, you'll see this green line right here is uh, water reuse. And, and although it, it may seem like that's gonna have a huge impact, it's gonna have uh, an impact on our supply and it's also gonna have a very large impact on our conveyance system, bringing that water from the east all the way to the west. This top portion shows us if we don't conserve, we're gonna need to find some additional supply uh, out into the future, but if we, if we have some conservation, uh, you're gonna see that we're gonna be okay moving forward. Now, keep in mind, these are average years. This year, we're gonna be uh, well below average for our water supply production. And so that's where uh, the planners of yesterday helped us uh, in years like this year to provide water supply for the residents. Moving forward, we'll just kind of skip over a lot of this here. Uh, you'll see that there are, are projects identified that end up resulting in that those costs. I wanna just pause on this one right here. This is a, a graphic we've seen in, in past uh, presentations about future conditions, and this is pressure. Uh, the red represents some concerns when it comes to pressure. And a little bit later today, we're going to talk about the water tank project and, and some progress we've made there. But this, this map helps us see that we need to do something uh, to help this area moving forward. Here's a, a map of the projects that are gonna be required in the future. 
those projects are going to turn into costs. Here are the projects in table format. Here is a brief description of those projects. Here is a, a map of some areas where we've identified projects moving forward. Another summary of condition related improvements, not upgrades, but replacements of existing pipes. And then ultimately it leads to a, 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 a summary that tells us moving forward, how much money we're gonna need to spend. Then a schedule and a summary. And we're back to where we started with the spending plan for the city. So with that quick summary update, I'll entertain any questions. Neil, quick <clears throat> question for you. What type of uh, ways are you gonna implement the uh, uh, resources of the water for as conservation? A good question. So uh, the city every five years submits a conservation plan uh, so the last one was completed in 2017. It outlined several different measures to take uh, for implementing conservation. The next one will be due in 2022. And in that plan, the recommendations, uh, first and foremost, were to replace the meters to provide accurate readings uh, to people to be able to have that initial accuracy. Far and above that is to give the people the data associated with uh, their meter readings so that they can understand uh, where, uh, where their peak times are and how much they're using. Uh, we've, we've titled that, shown in this bar graph, uh, Advanced Metering Infrastructure, an acronym for AMI. That metering project is moving along. There have been some hiccups related to the technology and the uh, communications. Uh, however, we have replaced over 9,000 meters in the city. Uh, and as soon as all the communication uh, methods are up and ready to go, we'll be able to switch those 9,000 plus moving forward another 5,000 per year for, to, for a total of you know, 24,000 when it's all complete to give people that uh, data associated with their usage. Additionally, uh, the city implemented a tiered rate infrastructure uh, in part because the state legislature passed a bill requiring incremental cost increases for volumes uh, and, and charged by the, the block that we have established. But even before, the uh, state uh, implemented that, the city's conservation plan recommended that. Now, Neil, some people, go ahead. I just wanted to add also with this AMI <clears throat> um, uh, deployment, we will also be uh, putting in the, in the hands of everybody in their cell phones, uh, uh, software that will allow them to track their data it will also provide educational components. So it's not just data driven or it's not just data information, but will, it'll also have educational um, uh, sound bites and, and opportunities for them to utilize what's called the water smart software. Uh, where there might be videos or it might be brochures, all electronically. So then they'll have access to certain things like, how do I fix that leaking toilet? or how do I uh, how do I find the leak in my in my uh, in my irrigation system or uh, whatever uh, you know for household appliances uh, for uh, smart appliances and so forth? There'll be a lot of uh, educational um, opportunities I think incorporated with that. And Lane uh, Lane Gray, who's online with us now, our water section manager, as well as Neil Winterton. They will be uh, hosting that and providing that information and making sure that it's, it's current and relevant and updated for, for the customers. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, Neil? Yes. Uh, on a, Just a couple of days ago on the national news, uh, they, they pointed out that Salt Lake City, which I'm, I guess means all of Utah has declared a, uh, I'm not sure how they, term, how they phrased it, but it, basically it was a water shortage for this year. Uh, how, are, how is Orem addressing that this year? Yeah, the, well, I think what you're referring to is, is this generally a state of emergency was announced because we are in what they call an exceptional drought, past extreme drought. Uh, Orem's handling that uh, very, we're, we're watching the water supplies very closely. We're watching the, the storage reservoirs and the, the runoff and the percentages uh, that yield uh, that, that our supply is based upon. Let me go back to this uh, graph that, that um, talks about our, our, our supply. Now we, we are in 2020 here, 2021. Uh, and so our existing supplies are up here at the yellow. And so our, our existing supplies are, are meeting our demands today. So the, the challenges that we are, are facing are generally uh, moving out into the future. And that's associated with uh, obviously the opportunity for drought and obviously uh, population growth uh, due to uh, the, the growth of the, of the city. So as we look at our demands right now, we've, we've been along these dotted lines. Uh, our total supply is up here. That's in an average year. So let's bring that down about right there. If you can see my pointer. So we're still, we're still trending okay in today's uh, supply world. However, uh, we need to implement those uh, conservation efforts and put the information into people's hands, get the education out there, and uh, also tighten up our system from leaks. Uh, that was one area that uh, we, we have greatly improved upon is actively seeking not leaks on the homeowner's side, but on the city's side where we might just have a small leak in the pipe system. We've actively been uh, finding those using technology, uh, echo technology that uh, has been very successful. So you might ask yourselves, well, Orem should implement restrictions like other communities. Have done. Uh, that's a, a touchy subject because the people of Orem through their fees and through their impacts uh, and their building permits have paid for the supply that you see displayed in graph form uh, in, in graphic format here. So if, if the residents have paid for that and it's available to them, well, shouldn't we, shouldn't we allow them access to that? We certainly encourage wise water use. We certainly, don't want and and don't want any type of, of abuse or misuse. However, uh, if if the residents have paid for it and the supply is available to that level today, uh, we haven't implemented the restrictions that others have implemented uh, due to supply or delivery uh, choke points. Uh, uh, I guess sort of a so um sorry Todd I just have a comment so it's really tough when we're in a drought even though people have paid for that water that if we need to do restrictions is I mean I think there would be a way to do it and say we're in a drought everybody realizes that we might need to put restrictions on I don't know just a thought Neil do you see do you see uh 
a form of rationing water this summer? Uh, I don't see that for Orem. I don't see that for uh, other communities. I don't, I don't see uh, a, a volume uh, restriction in place uh, for, for us this year. We have been watching the uh, supply forecast very closely. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, Utah is, is pretty reliant on storage reservoirs. And the storage reservoirs this year started off in not great, but okay condition. If we were to have multiple years of this drought condition, that would give us more time to pause and, and cause us to evaluate much more closely. But uh, given the condition that the reservoirs are in today, uh, the current uh, snowpack conditions, and the current predictions of river runoff, uh, we haven't discussed placing restrictions uh, upon the residents this year of, of volume or uh, other requirements associated with that or taking any punitive measures for watering times or watering volumes. The, the pricing of our water has been punitive enough to where the past four years we've experienced uh, extreme growth in our calls related to our uh, water bills, mostly to find out that people were over irrigating their lawns or had leaks in their irrigation system, leaks in their toilets. The, the steps, uh, although gradual, have been very positive in moving forward with wise water use, simply due to our, our, our rate increases. We haven't been able to put the information in the residents' hands yet on a day-to-day -day basis with the uh, uh, new metering devices. However, the, the pricing structure has performed uh, as expected in that regard. A, a, a follow-up question to that. Um, I recently read where Las Vegas uh, changed some of their rules and they actually went to, I, I think that, that as far as I'm concerned, they went just a little bit on the extreme side for what uh, I would consider here in Orem, but they went to a all ornamental grass is out. Um, they uh, they don't allow any grass if, if unless you walk on it, it's not you you cannot plant grass in your yard. Have um, and quite frankly, as a uh, homeowner in Orem, I've been a little bit frustrated at times with the fact that I want to zero scape my yard, but the law is are currently that I have to have a green lawn in my front yard to a certain percentage point because I'm not allowed to zero scape it. Have there been any consideration or any measurements of uh, A, ha has anybody looked at what that would save the city and have they actually considered it? Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, zero scaping and, and the I, I believe uh, back in, I think it was about 2016, 2017, the city updated the city code to allow for not zero scaping, but zero scaping uh, to not require uh, full on lawns, but allowed for different uh, features to be in place that, that would support a, uh, a minimal effort for water. I, I think we'll probably have, have to look a little bit more closely at that because there does seem to be confusion that, that that is absolutely required to have lawn. And I just, I, I believe that we changed that. So that's really interesting because our neighbor has a zero lawn in her front yard. So I did not, it's, it's very interesting, but um, I didn't realize that we were required to have a lawn. Yeah, it, 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 
Yeah, my we have a lot. <laughs> yeah, my, my interpretation is that they recently changed it to be you you're only required to have 50% of your front yard um, be grass and that was a recent change. But uh, I, I, I may be inaccurate in that, but uh, that's my understanding is the current city code is that you have to have at least half your yard. Uh, that's right. 50% is what they adopted. I believe it was about a year and a half ago, but I don't, I don't, it doesn't specify that it has to be grass. Um, there can be other types of, of, of plant life that is, that is used, but that plant We can life send you a copy of that or link to that code. In fact, if you'd like, we could make this another topic uh, for, for a future meeting as well where we kind of talk specifically about water conservation. I know that the Beautification Commission has been directly involved with that in modifying and updating the, the xeriscaping code uh, that we do have in place. So we can, we can certainly share that link with you and, uh, and then we can uh, make that a future agenda meeting uh, item if you would like. Okay, you know, I, I, I'm sure I'd be interested in that. If nothing else, I'd love to hear um, uh, or, or uh, ideas on how to get um, that information or more accurate information out to all of the citizens. Because like I said, I'm, yeah. I, I, I can't be the only one that has been you know, working under the assumption, oh, it has to be lawn, it has to be 50%. And you know, I've been struggling to, you know, to, to put water friendly native plants and stuff in my yard, but I'm like, okay, if I, if I change this, will my neighbors complain? Will somebody be it? And, you know, and I'm, and I'm trying to follow the rules, but I'm also trying to reduce my water use. And, and uh, I, you know, I've been, I've been tempted. I mean, I have one neighbor down the street, they actually put in, uh, I'll call it AstroTurf in their entire front, in their entire property, but, uh, and it looks nice. No one, complain but uh um it's uh, i'm like wow they don't have to water at all that's awesome and so you know i'm wondering if uh um yeah if, if there isn't you know if if nothing else if we make sure that we know it, if the current law is is good great if it could be changed to allow some more or if nothing else to make it more clear so that uh we know what our options are because obviously the less water I put on my lawn or the, the more desert friendly plants I have, um, I think as long as it looks nice, um, my neighbors are going to be happy. So I'm assuming like AstroTurf is legal permitted. It's green, but it's not grass. <laughs> there are some properties that do have artificial turf and across their entire property even, and it looks very nice. Um, but yeah, it is allowed, uh, I think, uh, with certain limitations. But again, okay. we can go into those details, I think. Um, today, we're trying to, uh, to give you a, a, an update of the water and sewer and storm master plan. And then I think one of the biggest items uh, of interest is with the tank location as well. And so we only have a half hour left. I'd like to stick to the schedule as best we can to present that to you. Neil, do you have anything else on the water? Nothing on the water, no. And do you have a quick update on the sewer? Uh, yeah, the sewer, we already gave the background of the purpose of the master plan and, and we started at the end. Um, I'll, just, I'll just skip actually to the end here. Uh, the same <laughs> graphic you'll see in the sewer because it's the same city and with the same growth trends. So Neil, are, are these reports available on the city website or can we get a, a copy of them, electronic copy? The drafts are available uh, on that utility, uh, on the city's website. Thank uh, you. It's on orem.org slash utilities. Yeah. And as the drafts turn into final documents, uh, and we are presenting this to the city council next Tuesday, uh, for the first review of the final document. And then once they are adopted, then we'll post the, the final versions out there on that website as well. We'll send you a link to that. Yeah, so this is a, 
a, a graphic I'll show you. It, it, it's got a lot of different dots on it. Uh, the key dot is this, or the key line is this solid red line right here, right about 13 and a half million gallons. Uh, that is the capacity of our water reclamation facility. You'll see this black line here is our projected uh, flow moving forward and we kind of get over the top of that. Uh, that's where we need to uh, implement some indoor conservation and we're hoping with that indoor conservation that that line stays below that uh, capacity. The trend with the, the actual is, is holding more steady than the projected. So that's a good thing on the sewer side. The spending, you'll see we, we've identified pipes that need uh, rehabilitation and some projects. Here's the, the summary. And there's the bar graph. Uh, that also will be uh, part of the bond spending. So the, the principles behind the sewer and the water are the same. You've got some growth uh, that is going to occur, but the majority of the spending uh, you'll see in this light green and the purple are maintenance related and system replacement. And, and here's the previous funding line. We just were not meeting uh, the, the maintenance and the replacement schedule that was needed. And that was okay up until that point. Uh, what, what happened as we recall and discussed before, our, our facilities got to a, an age that we needed to start doing some replacements similar to your home. You got to start putting uh, new pieces of uh, infrastructure in your home once they get to a certain age and it updates and refreshes it. And, not, and your furnace might need to be replaced one year and your roof may need to re be replaced another. Your carpet may be a little bit sooner. Uh, this type of infrastructure is no different. Uh, on the sewer, I will entertain any questions. I know I jumped through it quickly. You know, does, are you anticipating having to do any upgrades for phosphorus or additional nitrogen removal at the plant? Yes, that's a, a good question. Uh, we, we did an upgrade in 2011 to get us uh, very close to where we needed to be, knowing that there could be something in the future. But if you look at this, uh, project right here with uh, struvite is a, is a phosphorus product. Uh, that will be a part of our water reuse project that's on the water side. Uh, so uh, when you combine the struvite elimination and the water reuse, the nature of water reuse will require filters uh, so, so tight, if you will, or, or so, so good that it will benefit both the, the cleansing of the water and the nutrient side of the water. Uh, but we, we are watching those regulations that are fluctuating. Uh, there's nothing in concrete or nothing on paper as far as a regulation goes that gives us a target yet. So as soon as that target's created, we certainly will move forward with the studies necessary to determine uh, what, if anything, will need to be done in the future. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll turn the time over to Reed on the storm drain side of things. Thanks, Neil. Um, let's see here. Am I still on? Zoom crashes. Dang it. Uh, 
I think we lost Reed. Are you back? I'm coming. Did it crash? Yeah. Okay, I'm back, right? Yes. Zoom has problems with me, with my computer. So IT supposedly came down to fix that, but it didn't work. So let me share my screen here. All right, so I will uh, take a little bit of a different approach than Neil. I'm going to show you the projects first and then the funding afterwards. But uh, the stormwater master plan is a little bit different than um, uh, than wastewater, uh, where wastewater is uh, replacing things. Stormwater is adding new things. Uh, it's it continues to uh, to develop uh, the the system uh, to. Uh, add infrastructure, which helps us to uh, manage the stormwater that comes into uh, into the city. So just yesterday, we received the most recent draft of the, the master plan. I haven't had a chance to dissect it yet, but uh, grabbed a few screenshots from the, the plan to, uh, to, to show what we're doing. So the, the major points of the stormwater master plan are primarily um, uh, pipeline projects and for the foreseeable future uh, they will be focused on canal on uh, in putting um, pipelines in that will help us uh, convey our water um, away from uh, the West Union Canal. Uh, you'll recall in previous meetings that we've had that the West Union Canal uh, is is uh, the, the users are jump and ship. Uh, there are relatively few users that continue to use that canal uh, because it's in, it's in serious um, disrepair. And it's terribly expensive to, uh, to fix the parts that are, are, uh, are dangerous. And uh, there are some parts of the canal that we don't even know where the alignment is because it's buried. It goes through uh, neighborhoods and the river bottoms and it's just challenging. So with these uh, companies uh, closing shop, uh, we are making plans to convey our uh, to, to convey our, uh, our stormwater without the use of that ca that canal in along most of its stretch. So th that's what most of the the projects uh, will will be aimed at for the foreseeable future. Um, we'll, we're also uh, looking at improving. Uh, sumps that are in zones uh, where we have wells and want to protect the, the groundwater. Uh, we've got miscellaneous maintenance, unplanned repairs, and, and uh, fleet repairs that are, that are programmed into this uh, master plan. We'll get to the dollar figures of the, of the conveyance projects a little later. Just wanted to show a map of the alignment of the West Union Canal. Um, the West Union Canal uh, be begins uh, at the mouth of Provo Canyon and basically it flows through part of Provo where it joins in uh, to Orem uh, around Center Street and it continues down following the boundary of Orem and Provo for a while and then uh, along the southern boundary it turns to the northwest and terminates at Linden Hollow in Linden. This particular stretch is shared by two companies, the West Union Canal Company and the West Smith Ditch Company. Um, both uh, West Smith Ditch, or, sorry, the West, yeah, the West Smith Ditch Company has decided this is their last year to convey water. Uh, West Union Canal Company um, uh, also decided that they no longer want to convey water along this stretch. So they've made plans and, and have a well right here where they deliver water to the users downstream uh, in this green stretch, uh, those are the only users that they have left. They used to they used to take their water at the mouth of the Provo Canyon, but this red stretch between University Parkway and State Street was determined to be the most dangerous portion. Um, as you visualize driving down into Provo, you know that's on a hillside, and you've probably read articles that show that uh, canals can be dangerous and 
Canal above a residential area can be problematic. So the Western Canal said, we don't want any part of that liability. So they no longer take water along this stretch and, and take it here. West Smith Ditch as well doesn't want to maintain their canal. So they've got one more year leaving this stretch completely abandoned. But we have some stormwater that goes in there. So if the water goes in there and something happens, we're the sole responsible person. So we're or sole responsible uh, entity. Uh, so our plans are primarily to make efforts to get water out of the West Union Canal. We, we, we have water that flows in at Center Street at 400 South, at 800 South, at University Parkway, at various places along this stretch, um, uh, which, which uh, is right on the, the border of Provo and several spots along here. We've prioritized those areas and this master plan reflects the urgency to, uh, to get out of that uh, canal system because we will be primarily the only flow, particularly in this stretch, and eventually in this stretch as well if we don't make plans to get out. Uh, I mentioned well, wellhead protection zones as well. Uh, this, the stormwater master plan has made plans to, to, um, to safely uh, use stormwater uh, to, to limit its injection into our storm, into our uh, uh, wellhead, wellhead protection areas. This is the 250 day zone. We don't want any, we try to pipe water out of this red zone. The orange zone, we prefer to pipe it out and are making plans to do so, but at least we're putting pretreatment sumps on, on those, which means water goes into a big chamber first and the solids settle out and just the water uh, goes into, uh, into the, the aquifer. Uh, then this other area, the yellow area, is a 15-year zone, which allows sumps in certain conditions. And the blue is a safe sump zone. It's outside of any wells that we have. But I mentioned that the plan is taking some time, or has, is, a, is trying to plan to protect these, these wellhead areas. Uh, this is the north part of the city. Anything in red is a high priority project um, within an, and pl is planned to be constructed within the next 10 years. Um, most of the projects, you know, the, the, the most important one is this, the Center Street project where we're trying to take water out of the West Smith Ditch um, and convey it to the Provo River. Um, and uh, then also at 400 South, there's a project that's planned. Uh, that's planned. 800 South has a small one here at University Parkway, and then a significant project take conveying water down State Street uh, into Provo, um, the south end of Provo. But as you can see, there's numerous projects that we uh, are undertaking to uh, get out of the West Union Canal. To fund these uh, projects, we'll be um, bonding and using uh, available cash that we have. We have currently have a $2 million bond for these projects and expect a bond for more in the future. We've got about $7 million on hand right now that we'll, we'll use. Um, once the bond funds are, when, once we bond again and those funds are used up, we would revert to a pay-as-you-go basis and continue to chip away at the other master plan projects. And a future city council and likely administration would determine whether or not an additional bond would be needed. Um, we're talking 10, probably 10 years or so away. And we're also uh, pursuing federal funding. You've probably heard a recent talk of Biden's infrastructure investment plan. Uh, we believe that, that we have uh, some great projects that would qualify for that and are uh, pursuing money in that regard. There was also some COVID money that was, that was given to all the municipalities as part of the $3 trillion federal uh, COVID plan that they released. We're awaiting direction on how that money can be used, but perhaps it could be used to, for, for some of these projects. Uh, you, this, this graph shows what the funding is. I, I've noticed a couple of mistakes on it that I'll be talking to the consultant about is there's no debt service that's programmed in this, but this, this reflects um, uh, the, the purple is the canal abandonment project, and you can see how we're heavily focused on those in the first, uh, in the next five years. So um, 
knowing that we're sh we're short on time and um, the the next steps are we'll complete the internal review this week and modify the draft. We plan to present this to the city council at their meeting on the 27th, hopefully to adopt in May. And once it's adopted, we'll we'll uh, move forward in designing these projects and and uh, to to convey the uh, to to put these projects in that are needed for our stormwater system. We'll also need to uh, recalculate our impact fee because the master plan has significantly changed. So, any uh, any questions for me on stormwater? Okay, well, you've been a great audience. Appreciate your attention. Chris, I'll let you uh, or Todd, I guess, what next agenda item. This is the one I'm really interested in, right? <laughs> yes, uh, let's uh, let's hear about that uh, um, uh, 10 million gallon tank. Okay. B before we jump into that, I did want to mention that we, we are at the very end of our bond underwriting. And this is a closing memorandum. Uh, we anticipate that the bond will uh, be closed on the closing date will be April 27th at which time <clears throat> the bond funds will be transferred to the city and be made available. I know that there's been a lot of mention regarding uh, the financing and the funding for this. In total, the bond amounts $29 million. Um, and uh, I did wanna to bring to your attention, well, the bond amounts 29, but there's also a, a reoffering premium of 6 million. So. Uh, total cash available is going to be 30, 35 to $36 million associated with the bond. We also have $17 million of cash on hand. So we anticipate spending around $53 million over the next three years. Um, the cost of that is around, in terms of interest, I wanted to bring this last number to your attention, total interest costs for the dollars is 2.377%, which is extraordinarily low. So that's, that's our funding source. Without going into those details, I will uh, send everyone on the committee and we'll make this available on our website as well as soon as this is finalized, uh, this document. It goes into details then for every individual uh, utility for water, sewer, and storm. And those are basically the, the spending down plan is outlined here over the next, on a quarterly basis over the next three years. We'll share these documents with you as well. I wanted to bring that to your attention to make you aware of that in conjunction with the master plan. Um, so at this time, uh, we're gonna talk uh, in the remaining portion of our meeting, we're gonna talk about the water tank. As you're all aware, we've had a, a variety of options. We've narrowed it down to five locations that you see here. And, and you know, it's whittled down from about 12 or a dozen or so locations over the last two years. Um, <clears throat> Neil's gonna have some details on, on costs and how we arrived at these decisions. Uh, but we do have, uh, the yellow was a recommend, recommendation that we gave to the city council in January. That was after exhausting these other locations in, in effect. The bottom right corner in purple or magenta is the Farley property. We went and met with him two years ago and originally. We also met with the orchard owner here on the uh, west side at about eight or 700 west and 400 south. So this is 400 south down here. <clears throat> Um, he was not open to that idea at all either. In the blue area, we met with the school district. We determined that was probably the best and cheapest location at that time because of its proximity to 400 South. Uh, the school district came back and said no. Um, and then we, we presented option, the yellow option here because we didn't want to disrupt any playing fields. There aren't any designated playing fields here for baseball, softball, or soccer in the yellow area. The neighborhood uh, was uh, very uh, anxious about that, and they encouraged us to go back to Farley and look at other options. We did go back and we looked at the blue option again with, with the school district. 
We went back to the orchard on 7th West and they, he said no and the school district said no again. The school district was hesitant on us putting anything under the baseball field, um, although that was a, a viable option. And we also looked at the green option to the north. Um, and then it came down to uh, meeting again with Mr. Farley, who has been uh, open to the idea recently. In fact, uh, we're engaging with him on a contract to purchase 4.2 acres of that parcel. Uh, the property to the north in green and this property here in purple were very similar in overall cost. This is what we anticipate uh, a tank looking like on the site in purple. And then in the white area is the remaining one and a half acres of Mr. Farley's property. Uh, so what he would be selling to the city would be 4.2 acres. He had an original ask of around eight to $900,000 an acre. Uh, the appraised value for this was just over 500,000 and he dropped his price substan substantially down to around $600,000. Um, and so Neil, if you happen to have your spreadsheet available, uh, we, can, we can discuss some of the decision points that brought us to this recommendation of the city council. Are there any questions regarding this graphic before we move to the spreadsheet? I just want to make a comment. So as I understand it, the round tank is much better, right? You know, it's interesting. Uh, some will suggest that it's quite a bit cheaper. I think it might depend on the overall dimensions and the depth of the tank. Um, we met with, uh, with the CEO of WW Clyde yesterday, and he said he didn't think that there was a substantial change or cost difference. And so I, I don't know if that uh, some are more informed or not, but we have heard that it's around 10, maybe 10 to 30% cheaper. Uh, there are different uh, ideas and opinions. Casey and Dave are online right now. I'd be willing, I'd like to ask them what, what their thought is on that in terms of overall cost. Uh, my opinion is that you uh, circular tanks are more efficient for property use uh, versus rectangular tanks, but in terms of cost, I don't know if there's a significant difference between circular tanks and rectangular tanks. Thank you. <clears throat> You know, the reason why we were looking at the rectangular on the yellow, that yellow area, is because we were constrained by a road and neighborhood properties, uh, a round tank wouldn't, wouldn't fit there. And so I think ideally it might be best if it makes sense on that property to go with a round tank. So uh, Neil's going to have a presentation here on kind of the history and how we got to, arrived at this point. I think... Uh, well, I just, I just wanted to bring up the graphic. I, I found this presentation from 2019 <clears throat> where the decision was, was exploring all vacant properties in the area. And of course, uh, the orchard that you can see on the, on the bottom isn't even a, an orchard anymore <laughs> from that picture. And we eventually, through modeling and through uh, what the system needed uh, came to this graphic and we explored those different options. As Chris mentioned, uh, the main reason where we landed on this number three as an initial recommendation to the city council had to do with the uh, availability of, of two uh, and then the red area here, it, it just wasn't an option. Um, and two didn't, wasn't an option. One was a, a, a programmed area and it's further from fourth south, which adds the costs up. So uh, with that, uh, let's just dive into this spreadsheet that uh, I created for a tool. It was, it was an internal, tool to use amongst ourselves. It's not in uh, presentation format, if you will, that I would present in a report or, or as an exhibit. It was a tool that 
we put together uh, to, to make a, a, an informed decision on these locations. So let's, let's just dive into this uh, spreadsheet. Uh, looking back at this uh, graphic, there aren't just several options here for the tank. There are several options for the tank and there are several options for construction phasing and there are several options for where to put the, the spoils or the dirt. Uh, and then there are different costs associated with the distance from where the water needs to go. And that's what we're gonna to attempt to capture here uh, on the spreadsheet. There are some assumptions that the tank wherever you put it, might be uh, the same costs if you just dig a hole and place a tank. We did assign an increased cost to a rectangular tank based on some information that uh, was given to us. Uh, and we assigned a value that that would cost more than a circular tank for the same volume. Uh, export. Uh, the purchase. At the time we created this, uh, the entire Farley property was in, in, uh, in question. And I put a, 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 a value here to be able to analyze where it would make sense and at what cost it might make sense to, to consider that. The initial cost didn't even make it uh, an option for us to want to pursue because it was too costly. Associated with any of these other locations, we'd need to work with Alpine School District. And so there's a cost there. 600 West is the narrow street uh, going into the site there. We would need to widen that. That would come with the cost. Uh, if you bury the tank deeper, it comes with a cost. Uh, putting the well in the booster station comes with a cost due to the constructability of, of the constraints, uh, restoration of a field where you wouldn't have disturbed it initially comes with a cost, um, power drain line, longer paid pipelines, fourth south uh, and fourth west need some transportation upgrades. So we needed to acquire some property on that corner as well. Neil, can I mention also that uh, regarding the, the fields, we got uh, really current and updated information regarding a quad for a softball field is about three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. And then the baseball field was about, well, one and a half, 1.25 million dollars. And these were values that we got from uh, our city engineer who uh, got these from, I don't know what city it was. Mason. Was it was it Payson? Yeah. And they were doing both of those types of projects. And so those are real values, real dollars that uh, uh, based on most current um, estimates or actual, actual costs, bidding costs. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. So as I, as I'm, I'm going to hide all these assumptions, but the base cost of the tank <clears throat> is included in, in the analysis. So Let's just imagine it's about $10 million as the base cost for, for the tank. And then these are uh, variables associated with that. I'm going to scoot this line all the way up and, and hide the assumptions now. Uh, just one. Oh, well. Okay, there we go. Okay. At the top of each rectangular block is a title. Uh, and in, on line 25, that's West location or the original location as presented to the city council. I don't know, maybe six months ago now. And associated with that uh, are, are some small assumptions, meaning, well, let's raise it up about two feet. With that uh, proposal comes pros and cons, which are shown in E and F. Uh, the, the pros and cons are not always 
measurable in terms of monetary dollars. And so we need to keep that in mind is uh, how much is a, a, an area that's not programmed for sports, how much is that worth in terms of dollars? How much is uh, construction fatigue of the neighbors up near the fitness center, how much does that cost us? This spreadsheet was intended to solely focus on the cost aspect of it. When you add up all of the pieces and parts associated with placing uh, a tank in that west location, we come up with a total value of 4.5 million. Now that's not uh, a total cost, that's not an added on cost. This is to keep things relative to each other as far as locations go. <clears throat> You'll see in this uh, analysis that the export value or, or the, the dirt we're gonna haul away was allocated at $750,000. Uh, the next option is to place that uh, tank in the same location. Let me just bring this back. Uh, and, and this is why the analysis kind of dives so deep is if we build the tank in, in number three location, we could put all the, the dirt over here and not cause all the trucks to go out here and not disrupt baseball and not disrupt softball. But then we would have to redo all the grass in this area and it would disrupt that area. So that's the level of detail that we went as far as trying to determine some of the best options available to us. And that's what's represented in the west location, place the fill north of the baseball field and raise the soccer field up. Uh, no export there, uh, still a rectangular tank. You still have to buy the Larson property you have to uh, perform all these other options associated with that. Now, if we were to look at that and ask yourselves, well, is it worth $200,000 more to not run all those trucks out to Fourth South? Maybe it would be. Okay, that's a decision we, we would need to make. I wanted to go uh, into some detail on these two options so that we could then quickly scroll down through the other options that presented itself. We could put the tank in the north baseball field. We could raise the elevation of that and then have no baseball disruption. Uh, that would result in a, in a cost there. Uh, the, the con is a construction fatigue of the neighbors up in that north area. Then we also, are, uh, we have issues with the land and water conservation easement. It makes the pipelines a little bit longer, so more disruption in addition to the cost. North baseball field, raise the elevation and put the spoils underneath the baseball field. Well, it's an option, um, but it, it's not a good option. Not only do we have a little bit more cost, but we disrupt baseball. Uh, we could put the tank under the baseball field. We could raise the whole site and put the spoils in the north part of the field there. There's an analysis of that. Uh, under Alpine School District softball field, relocate the baseball to the softball field and build a softball quad on Orem property. That has significant costs, as you can see, not only is it uh, 4.6 to the city, but it also result in 1.2 or three to Alpine School District. So we're getting up into some high costs. Obviously, there's some benefits to that. You would refresh your baseball field, you'd refresh your softball field, and you'd refresh all of the softball fields. Uh, but you, you put a lot of area out of commission for two years, and it's a high cost. Uh, what if you just put it under the Alpine School District softball field and rebuild all of the the two fields associated with that. Uh, there's a cost there. You could make it a circular tank. Um, so there's some savings. You know, if I can mention on that as well, we did go back to the school district two to three other times 
and asked them again and again if we could go there. And every time uh, they rejected that idea, although they did entertain putting a baseball field on that property. And then they ultimately they came back and said, we need this land for a future elementary school when the other school is decommissioned, we'll build the new one over here and then, and then flip the site. So that's, that was off the table. That was in uh, one of our preferred options. So another option was to purchase the entire Farley property, raise the site, export about half the material. And uh, that option uh, included some other assumptions that maybe in the future we could sell off the east portion of the property in residential lots. Uh, that option also gave us the opportunity to possibly not uh, improve the surface. If you look at uh, all of the options associated with it, if you put a new tank here, all of the recreation amenities are still in place and everything is still whole. So as part of the analysis, we, we asked ourselves uh, what, what we could uh, do with the property if we wanted to. And we could leave the property uh, unimproved for the time being. Uh, so that's why uh, that number shows up the way it does there. Farley sent us an email and said, look, that option isn't available. Uh, purchasing the entire property uh, it was just not an option. So we had to change our assumptions and, and, and have another uh, analysis. And the title of this scenario is the Farley property based on the March 31st email conditions at 605 an acre. Once we don't have access to the whole site, we don't have the opportunity to stage the dirt on, on the whole site. We have to do some export, but the cost of the property is included. Uh, there is the credit because this intersection for going on 15 years at 4th South, 4th West, uh, has needed a transportation upgrade. And the opportunity to get the, the property for that transportation upgrade has presented itself. As Chris showed in his previous exhibit, uh, the bottom half of this is the part that the owner would retain. <clears throat> so, uh, even though it would cost much more than that to uh, improve the surface, depending on what you put on there, uh, there is a, we have to do some amount of, of restoration. And, and even if we don't fine grade it, we need to rough grade it. We need to do something with it so that it's not a, a problematic piece. Um, when you look at that option right there, that presents a, a least cost option. Then you might ask yourself, well, what if we put uh, a circular tank up where number one shows? So we, we asked ourselves that. Um, and, and there's the analysis with all the assumptions there. With the Farley property still coming up as uh, the least cost option when comparing each comparable aspect. Uh, when you add in all of the pros and cons shown in this, these columns here, to me, it, it's a resounding recommendation, uh, a, 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 a com very compelling evidence for the Farley property. Uh, we originally would not have said, let's place a tank on property that we don't own until the numbers presented itself uh, to do so. And not only do the numbers present itself to do that, but the uh, un unmeasurable or, or non-monetized pros and cons also heavily point to that option. 
So I think with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to comments or questions. You know, just a comment on the Farley property, having listened in to both of the uh, public meetings, I think if you told the residents that the Farley property was gonna be unimproved, that is not the impression they got at the end of the meeting. That's they were not... clearly under the understanding that there would be improvements on top of the tank. Y yes, and, and, and again, I'd like to reiterate, this is for the analysis of comparing what we would be required to do, not what we would uh, do. If you look at all of these options here, e every single option over here in any scenario, and, and we're not even showing underneath the baseball field here, but those require immediate remediation associated with the construction of the tank and water funds. Uh, when, you, when you put it over here, other funding mechanisms become available, impact fees, uh, park fees, uh, and, and care monies available. Uh, so we, we have not gotten into the final uh, plan for what exactly will be associated with that because frankly we ha we haven't closed this deal with Farley uh, and I would I would ask that the the members of the commission and those here uh, keep the the information here somewhat confidential not in secret uh, but just out of respect for the process of real estate acquisition uh, all of these items are, are available via grammar request or their public information uh, due to the, the Open Meeting Act and everything else. But I would just uh, encourage, uh, encourage you to, to be patient with the city's efforts in acquiring the property. So Casey, you're, you're right. I, I don't uh, represent that 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 will not happen. What I will represent is that if, <clears throat> if we compare what is required, uh, then that, that is the case. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question or a response to your comment or not. I, I think though, in order to be transparent with those residents on the, around the Farley property, you, you would have to say the cost to improve that property, as we discussed, is X. Because it's, at some point, regardless of the funding, that money has to be spent from the city if that's what the anticipation is. Yeah, and we, we can produce that, uh, I, I guess, when, when that decision is made. Farley is, is not... He has actually placed some restrictions on that acquisition of, of what we, we can do with that. Uh, so those details need to certainly be worked out. It, 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 in my opinion, I, I'm not opposed to either one, but I think you need to include all the costs that would be associated with the Farley property purchase prior to approving the purchase of the property. So you could then make a comparison. Well, not, that's where the tool of this active tool, if you, if you, you know, zero that out, not that it's zero cost because all of the other tank options include the surface restoration. Uh, you're, you're still, you're still almost the same there as far as costs go and, and to the detail of the analysis for this. So I would represent that uh, this is still a, a long ways ahead of other locations for a recommendation. The, the, the benefits to the property for, for long-term maintenance for the water utility itself uh, just all, all of those pros and cons listed there far outweigh uh, uh, when you when you are in close numbers range. And and again, I 
I'm not claiming to be the constructor of a tank. And so I, I believe in my numbers. I trust my numbers. Uh, I've, I've created estimates and concept plans. Uh, and I, I, I feel confident in those. However, I'm confident to know that uh, there is some uh, wiggle room as far as pluses and minuses go to, to know that um, it, even if you zeroed that out, to me, they're the, still the same and the benefits far outweigh uh, the cons for this location. Neil, please. Are, are, you, are you going to present this to the city council? Uh, I will serve at the will of the city council uh, and the city manager. We have shared this spreadsheet. Uh, I have shared this with all the city council uh, last couple of few weeks ago, as far as just the document itself. Uh, we've had a couple of conversations uh, with, with other council members and we're happy to uh, present whatever, whatever we're asked to, for sure. So <clears throat> in our they, meetings, they, go ahead. I, I was just going to say uh, among council members, we, we didn't know, I think this is uh, a little more completed than what you gave us before, isn't it? Or a little more detail. But anyway, uh, I, it, it I, has been a, a growing analysis and this is the most detail that uh, we've had based on the evolution of the process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it'd be good to give an update. And Casey, and, and I know that Dave Pitcher put a comment in regarding comparing improved remediation sites to non-improved at Farley site in the cost summary. So Casey and Dave and, and uh, Councilman Sumner, we, we have not represented that this site is improved in this analysis. We fully anticipate and expect that it will be improved and it'll be fully improved uh, when, when, Farley, it, you know, when Farley does move, we anticipate purchasing the remaining one and a half acres and developing a parking lot, pavilion, uh, uh, bathroom facility uh, to make it uh, uh, more of a more of a park. Um, the field could be uh, we talked about xeriscaping today. The, the field could be over the tank. It could be a um, an artificial turf field. We would prefer not to put grass that we have to water on top of the tank. Um, so those types of details and analysis are above and beyond what Neil has represented here. And so we're, we anticipate that there will be other funds available as Neil suggested uh, from the care tax dollars, as well as impact fee revenues that could be applied for this. Um, and so in the spirit of transparency, we have represented that to the council in this analysis. Thank you. For their consideration. Thanks for your uh, time today. And, and Chris are, and I are available uh, to dive deeper, to have further discussions with, with anyone here or anyone of the public. Uh, we're happy to go through um, any, any of the details. Any, any more? Hey, Chris, this is yes. okay. I appreciate the invitation just to listen in. I appreciate that. It, you know that I've been working on encouraging Orem City with more storage for over probably 25 years. So <laughs> and I, I, I never thought it'd come back to my front door though. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and I support, I fully support the city in doing what they need to do here in this area of the city. Um, but now as a neighbor, uh, 
I agree that I think everyone assumed that there would be a city cost of improving something. Uh, and so that if there's restrictions by Farley, um, I, you know, that's something that would certainly have to be known right up front before executing the deal. Yeah, that'll be, that'd be a part of the agreement. Uh, I've not even seen a draft a version of the agreement. So that it's literally underway as we speak, those negotiations right now. I know he has mentioned before making it more of a passive park. Uh, perhaps it would have a nice flat area where you could kick a soccer ball or throw a Frisbee or run out there with your kids or a, a, a pet or whatever. There could be a, a trail that goes around it. There's, there's a variety of ideas regarding this. I did put it in the, in the chat room. You know, there's nothing finalized on this whatsoever. And that's where we have a hard time putting a hard number on that because nothing is really final or planned uh, to that degree or level. However, we do know that um, a, a restroom is gonna cost you around uh, 150 to 200,000. A pavilion might be another 150 to 200. Parking lot's going to be around 250. And then, you know, four acres of, if we were to put grass and sprinklers on there, um, that's going to be a substantial cost. So uh, we have represented that also to the council that there are, there are additional costs that will be needed um, at the completion of this project at some point yet to be determined, whether it's immediately after this, I would assume it will be, but it will be out of other funding sources um, above and beyond the water fund. Yeah, if you start looking at life cycle, then you really have to start looking at what the city is giving up on tax revenue for the five acres of, well, four acres of uh residential i guess that the other alternative is residential which then the city would get revenue long term right but uh that is true um alternatively though there is a significant long-term a repair and replacement cost that has been reduced by putting it right next to 400 south and consolidating all of the these new amenities together on one site for example, you know, we, it'd be a thousand more feet to run one water line to the north field um, per, per water line. And we're going to have a line for the well and the booster station. You're gonna have a drain line. You're gonna have a line that comes out, out of the bottom of the tank. Um, and that additional cost over thousands of feet over a lifetime does add, add up quite substantially as well. So does that change the low? Is this also the well location? And so yes. you wouldn't buy the home? Okay, That's so correct. That, yeah, you'd save the $650,000 for that, that acquisition right off the top. Yeah, so but everything the land of, there, okay. One thing we do have a significant concern with is the Land and Water Conservation Fund at the park itself. Uh, that they have, a, they have a, a, a big hammer and they're willing to, to, to wield it. And we are very concerned about that. We've had to mitigate before over a, uh, a small site that was a cell tower at, or let's see, it was um, Cascade Park. We, we became made aware of this by the Land and Water Conservation Fund manager, Susan Zare Crazy, at the, uh, at the parks national, or she, she, she's a, she has primacy for National Park Service, U.S. National Park Service in the state. And uh, we had to mitigate that elsewhere off site. And it was a small little piece of land because there was a cell tower on a park that was developed with land and water conservation fund dollars. We had to purchase land off site and develop that. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that cost us, but it was a significant challenge. We anticipate facing that directly. Um, they're fully aware of this uh, at the community park if we were to put a tank over there as well. So. There were some things we couldn't put a, a real dollar amount on that were just out there. And so that's where the ball diamond, you say that that comes under the water, the land and water conservation. Any, anything in community park is under, under this easement with the land and water conservation fund for 
for options one, three, or the baseball field. Option two is actually on Alpine School District property. And that's where that really became a really ideal site for us. It was comparable in my mind to Farley uh, to, with many respects. You don't have that, uh, that oversight of uh, National Park Service on that. Yeah, those are hard to put dollars on to that. It is, and, and, and yet we went back to the school district three times. And uh, you know, we, we respect their decision and their plan to, to flip their site in the future albeit it could be 15 or 20 years, but they have to plan ahead too. And we understand that as the utility, uh, utility operators. So well, back, I, I appreciate the opportunity just to listen in. You bet. And, and if Dave, if, and you and Casey, we, we'd be more than happy to talk a little more in detail regarding the analysis and some, what are the thought process went behind this. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be providing links to the, uh, uh, the water conservation code. I made a note of that. And then orm.org slash utilities will have these master plans updated there. Again, they're draft and they're tr transitioning to final. Um, we will update uh, the bond information regarding the Lewis Young, Robertson, Birmingham report um, and what we presented for our bond dollars uh, in, in that document. That'll be uh, published and made available on that same site as well. And then we'll have a link to this cost analysis out there for, for your review. And we'll provide that to everybody here in this meeting uh, this morning. So uh, Mr. Hadley, we'll turn the time back over to you as our chair. Thank you, Chris, appreciate it. Um, does anybody else have anything else they'd like to bring forward to the committee? Okay, that being said, then I think it is, I'll accept a, uh, a, a proposal to, to uh, adjourn. So moved. Do I have a, do I have a second? I think Jim may have seconded. Okay. We're all in favor of this, Todd. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> no uh, further delay needed. <laughs> okay. Thanks, great. everybody. Anybody thanks opposed? Everybody. We're out of here. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the information. I thought uh, that was really helpful and uh, a lot of work being done there. I appreciate all that uh, Neil and Chris and Reed have done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Casey. Thanks for Thank everyone's you. participation. We, we need Im involved citizens. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. We'll see you. <laughs>